Yes, it's Angela, and she's going to be giving her thesis presentation on do political film adaptations affect voter knowledge? I know my first slide was my introduction slide, so I think you already know me at this point. <laughs> but I'm Angela Hart. My thesis project examines the ramifications on voter knowledge due to films. I was inspired to undertake this project due to my background in film studies, paired with my interest in politics. So after my independent study with Professor Owen last year, analyzing how political film adaptations are created, I was inspired to undertake this project to determine if political film adaptations can affect voter knowledge. Please work. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so there's a long history of media's influence, whether it's for viewers or listeners. For instance, the birth of a nation had some people protesting the streets due to the racist portrayals being depicted on film. It was also thought to reinvigorate the KKK during that time period. The Payne Fund studies demonstrated an early interest in film studies and its influence on people. They had children watch a series of films over several days, then asked them years later as teenagers if the films affected them. While their methodology is somewhat questionable, it's, it's noteworthy that they asked them about the influence of films. And then even radio, when Marston Wells adapted his novel, War of the Worlds, for a special radio broadcast, if people tuned in after the announcement that it was an entertainment program, some people believe aliens were invading the New Jersey area. <laughs> Presently, adaptations make up 75% of miniseries and television movies. Adaptations adjust, alter, or make suitable. Simply put, they demand change from the original source material. Probably some of the most notable political adaptations are those by Oliver Stone. JFK perpetuated the notion that there was a conspiracy and that information was being kept from the American public. Unlike previous studies, however, that focus on big box office movies, I accepted the HBO television film yeah. Recount, yeah. Recount, which is based on the 2000 election, Bush versus Gore, and the issues that occurred down in Florida during the voter tabulation recount process and trying to determine what course of action to take to get their candidate elected in the end. Um, this study is hopefully a bridge to television film studies and film studies, and due to the fact that HBO is a more mature audience, it's more indicative. test if viewers learn from recount, I formulated two hypotheses. Firstly, the recount would educate viewers on people and their political parties for those individuals involved in the 2000 election, as well as viewers being able to define key terms such as chats and difficulties. For my study, I utilized a multi-method approach. Firstly, I analyzed recount in order to determine how information was presented to the audience, what were the implications, what people could potentially take away. Secondly, I have participants fill out a pre-survey, watch your count, do a post-survey, and discuss the film. Lastly, I spoke with two film and media experts in regards to the influence of film historically, as well as two of the real-life inspirations for recount characters. I spoke to Democrat Ron Klain, who was portrayed as the protagonist in the film, as well as Max Stavanovich, who was portrayed as Kevin Harris's advisor during the recount process. They were both wonderful, and they talked to me for over an hour, each of them, and they were candid about their experiences, and I found the feedback extraordinarily informative. My thesis is composed of three main parts. First, my analysis of the film recount, and based on my research, there has never been an academic study of the film before. I treat the first is fiction portion, which I compare the film recount to the historical events that actually transpired, what was left out, what was dramatized, and why, as well as my focus group data to test and acknowledge the game post viewing. Okay. Recount addresses the butterfly ballot issues that occurred in Florida during the 2000 election. This is a sample ballot, and hopefully you can see where some of the confusion may have arisen from due to the fact that people were unsure if they voted for Al Gore or Pat Buchanan. A recount opened the film with this image, subtly hinting to the viewer of the ballot's importance, and it became a constant image of the film, held up by characters, referenced in dialogue, and so it's interesting that they opened with that shot. The ballot's design also inspired the 2000 related key terms, such as hanging chats and dimples, which I counted, which I tested for in the pre survey and post survey. In regards to key words and definitions that pertain to the 2000 election, the dialogue explains a lot of important terms that a viewer needs to know in order to follow the film's narrative. This particular clip, which I will, will play, <laughs> is of Dennis Leary as Michael Cooley. Um, he, he defines a chat, hanging chat, and dimple in conjunction with visual aids to enhance an audience member's understanding. Boy, I went down my list of 2,000 votes. Who wants 175,000 records that didn't fit count machines? have declared nine votes, okay? So that's 175,000 uncounted ballots. Because nothing like that even happened. Because uncounted ballots are fucked, okay? They're primitive. You get cardboard chat that, that get punched but don't go all the way through the hole so they hang off the edge of the ballot. Hang away chat. Chat. What? There's no rest. The plural of chat is chat. That's great to mark. Jesus. Yeah. So when you take these ballots, and you put it in the tabulating system, what happens is the hanging chad can push back into the holes, and the machines read it as if the holes were never actually punched. So then, these are 
got his underbrush for wet. Sometimes your hands had don't even hang. They're just dimple. Yes. Okay, which means that the voter did not line the ballot properly in the machine, but just didn't push hard enough to get the chat to go to the other side. How hard is this a country paper ballot? It's pretty goddamn hard when you're 80-something years old, you're athletic, and you're blind as a fucking bat. Unfortunately for us, the blind fucking bats tend to vote Democratic. Not to mention the fact that the voter matters. Sometimes these things don't get cleaned up for years and years and years, they get completely gamed up with chat. Next thing you know, it's impossible for the voter to actually penetrate it at all. So you just end up with dimples and chat. Because they happen in poor neighbors where they don't have up to date brand new voting equipment. And I don't have to tell you who those people, generally speaking, vote for, okay? All I'm saying about is we have to have actual live human beings doing this thing. In that clip, he addresses why it's important for the Gore team to seek a hand recount and it demonstrates the political ideology that was potentially affecting the outcome of the election. Do you think it's fair to say that the
to 77% getting correct on a post-test. Captain Harris went from 19% to 94%, and Warren Christopher went from 7% to 61%. As I mentioned before, even though she's not portrayed in the most flattering light, my focus group members clearly remember Captain Harris, as well as the other characters in political parties. There we go. In regards to defining recount-related terms, most of my participants already knew what a recount was, going from 87% to 100% post-viewing, but there was a large difference in defining chads and dimples. Only 39% of people knew what a chad was on the pre-survey. On the post-survey, 81% of them knew what a hanging chad was. Similarly, on the pre-test, 26% knew how to define a dimple. On, on the post-survey, 84% could define a dimple. I do believe that these numbers reflect the intelligence of the Georgetown student body however, because they already had a working knowledge base of politics or of the recount process itself. So if I had a more diverse group, the numbers probably would be different. I'm sorry. Here we go. Lastly, in regards to identifying key information, there was a large difference in the pre- and post-test results. 10% knew Democrats wanted to recount in four districts before viewing recount. Post-viewing, 84% knew the correct answer. 13% of viewers knew David Boyce was dyslexic on the pre-film. 74% knew on the post-viewing about his disability. Also, being able to identify the Florida Supreme Court justices and their political affiliation went from 10% to 58%. I will mention that this particular chart is not statistically significant due to my sample pool only being 31 people in total, but I believe if I had more individuals, it would be significant. I created additive scales to test these knowledge questions, allowing me to determine that on average, participants were able to correctly identify four more people in their political parties, as well as to find three more recount-related terms. I found that adaptations tend to portray some of the information involved, but not all of the information in their film. They're not a supplement to gain more knowledge. I do believe that they can be used in a classroom setting to provide a generalized knowledge base, but more research should be done by students in the future if they wish to learn more about the recount process or the 2000 election itself. Films give a general overview, but are not designed to, say, to convey specifics unless it's for the film's dramatic purpose. After conducting my study for a year, I can demonstrate that participants identified characters and could identify key terms related to the recount, so the recount did educate viewers in the end. That being said, I do not know for how long, because I wasn't able to follow the participants weeks or months after the fact, so that is something I would like to test for in the future. Let's go. So, thank you so much for your time. My contact information is on the handouts, and I have my business cards and information over there if you'd like to grab something. Um, I created a website for more information for you to visit, but if you have any questions, please tell me now. For those who didn't read, haven't had a chance to read the full thesis, this represents a huge amount of work on your part. Um, uh, you know, the two methods that you use, the analysis of the film and the, all of the focus, yeah. many focus groups you conducted, um, you know, it's really thoughtful work. Um, Thank you. <laughs> and I know it was a huge uh, investment of energy and time. Um, <clears throat> so congr you know, congratulations. Thank you. Um, I think, you know, this is the, the question I have is really for the benefit of the group here because you've really addressed, I think, all, you know, most of my comments, <laughs> you know, by this point. Um, could you just, you know, maybe for a, a few minutes, just, you know, talk to the group about why look at this now, right? So that was sort of, um, you know, a question we discussed earlier on, and then I know you uh, discuss in the thesis. Um, and I don't know if you, and, you know, I uh, have to see the final version to see if it made it into the beginning or the end. Um, but, you know, can you tie this to the present day? Yes. Um, and sort of, uh, you know, talk to us a bit about why look at this now? I know I made a slide because I remember we talked about this. I was trying to find it. I like 50 <laughs> slides in total. So um, the 2000 election, so recount was made in 2008, eight years after the election occurred. And so it's really interesting in regards to the historical, the historical importance of this actual recount process because it was unprecedented and then it did have an impact on America's history. And so the 2000 election itself is very important. But there are still issues today with voting. So there are voter restriction laws, people need IDs to vote. So there are still implications in regards to voters actually going and casting their ballots for whoever they chose as their candidate to represent them. And so that is something I am integrating throughout the thesis itself because I actually found a clip where um, Kevin Spacey is doing an interview discussing one of his more current roles on House of Cards. And someone actually referenced him doing a lot of political thrillers and he referenced Recount. And he said, oh, there are still issues going on. And then the uh, journalist actually 
played a clip of Hillary Clinton discussing Recount the Film and how her aides had her watch it because it was a relevant topic. And so it is something that even looking back on still maintains <coughs> some relevance due to the themes of the film and it, uh, and it does act as a time capsule and according to Ron Klain, he thought that was one of the biggest things that he liked about the film was that it portrayed a lot of their struggles and so it's something that they can look back on and say, okay, well, now let's make sure this never happens again. So it is kind of a warning as well. So I do believe this film is really important for so many reasons. I mean, if you have any specific questions on other things, please tell yeah, me. Yeah, no, I mean, the fact that we're in the middle of another election, you know, yes. um, election year. Well, plus, it's now, where's my other slide? I made this. So now Recount is available on a lot of different platforms. This is a, I took this from Amazon Prime, so you can watch it for free on Amazon. Anyone with an HBO subscription can watch it. The DVD is only $4.99, so it's readily available, too. It's not actually a hard-to-find film. It's not something that just kind of came and passed. People can still find it very easily today. So I thought that was interesting too, the fact that it's also on YouTube, some parts, so anybody and everybody can actually watch it now, even if you don't have an HBO subscription, which is something I found interesting the study itself, because HBO, you need to have money to buy a subscription, you need to, you're probably more of an educated audience, but now it's available on a wider scale. So, I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Professor Bo, did you have any questions? I do have a question. So this is something that I've wrestled with a lot in my own research, which is like, what should count as political knowledge? Like, what is important? What do we think is important for people to know? And I wonder if like, knowing what a chat is, is that political knowledge? Or is that historical knowledge? And how do we distinguish between those things? How do we like from a normative perspective, what, okay, well, that's what should we be measuring? Um, <laughs> so I found one of the reasons why I tested for hanging chat, dimple, and just recounts because those are the big terms, you know, the sunshine standard, lesser known. There are a lot of terms associated with the election that I learned about myself because I was too young at the time to really recall you know, key information. And so I learned about them doing research with my literature review and things of that nature. And when I did the fact versus fiction, I was doing all sorts of um, you know, books on it. And so the, the film really touched on the key themes and the key terms, not all of the terms. So it kind of per, per conveyed the political knowledge that somebody would need to know in a general sense. So you might not need to know what hanging chat is, but I did come, this is probably like a side note. So on How I Met Your Mother, the character Ted is always wearing a hanging chat costume on Halloween. Yes. And people didn't understand that reference until they watched this. And I had three people tell me, I get that show now. I understand what that joke was. <laughs> I'm so, so old. <laughs> well, people are like, you know the show How I Met Your Mother? Like, I know exactly what you're talking about. And so I had three different people, and then other people from those three comments jumped on the bandwagon saying, now I know what you're talking about, because the film gave them a contextualized, you know, Chad Dimple and things like that. And so I don't really know how that portrays political knowledge, but they did learn about, you know, contextualizing another television of sorts. But it did offer just general terms, and so in regards to identifying like, political information, I think I was more testing for knowledge base about the historical event itself. So I hope that answers that question, yeah. but I did find it interesting they were learning about this and it was affecting how they were viewing other television shows. I thought that was just fascinating because same thing with Raiders of the Lost Ark. Instead of referencing another historical event like, you know, the Supreme Court did XYZ and it found that out as well with this, you know, whatever, they were talking about films and movies and they didn't actually reference other historical events. So I thought that was interesting in itself. Just related to Professor Bodie's question, I'm trying to remember, I think on your pre and post surveys, right, for your focus groups, I mean, you sort of had, didn't you, did you have screening questions that were like sort of, yes. how, or was it their political ideology or mm -hmm. affiliation, and if they'd seen the film before, or sort of, yeah. or, right? So what ended up happening was, because I wasn't paying participants, everybody came in with an interest in politics, so everybody had at least like a seven right. on their interest in politics scale except for a few people because um, there was a really wonderful professor. I forget his last name, his first name was Mark. He offered them extra credit if they wanted to come. I only had four people, <laughs> but he, he had them come. And so other than them, who only had like a knowledge base of like two on a scale of one to 10 if they cared. But aside from that, everyone else had a working knowledge or you know, were interested in politics, which is why I think that also affected my statistics. And so I wasn't quite sure how to integrate that in regards to doing an analysis of who came in with that because it was already so high. It was almost as if the people who, were on, who weren't interested were the outliers. So it wasn't really worth it for me to do a statistic and a statistical analysis of you know, the interest level because everyone was already interested. I mean, most people actually had 10 as the highest, so <laughs> everybody came in interested. I mean, that helped me get more people involved. 
Um, originally, this is again a side note, but I originally had 38 people. So people came in early or left late or something, or came in late, left early. So I had to pull some surveys. So I, even though I had 38 people in total, I was only able to use 31 results. So <laughs> in regards to the pre and post test, I would have loved to have more people in a more diverse group. I think that's something to look out for in the future or something like this. So I know you had a question. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, you had talked about further research and possibly being able to assess learning long term as opposed to like this. That really interests me. Um, you administered the survey after the immediately after the post group. Yeah, this group is that right? Okay. So I mean that was one of the limitations. I think you know again I would, for one of the PhD um, acceptances they liked my research proposal where you know test this long term so I would have them do this you know month later, two months later, and so I'd be able to see how long they retained it. I mean, aside from Kevin Harris and you know, Ron Klain, who are such big players, I don't really anticipate them remembering these characters for too long. Since you've thought about further research yes. and how to assess, um, possibly assess long-term learning, can you talk a little bit about mm -hmm. how you think your methodology might look different if you were to conduct further research? And yes. if you would ask the same kind of questions, like, name these key players, you know, Catherine Harris, Supreme Court justices, and so on, or do you think your questions might be a little bit different? Um, I probably would revise the survey looking back after I did more of a content analysis of the film. I would want to ask more about the film itself with the news footage, because they had reenacted footage where the characters of, you know, Lager and Catherine Harris reenacted the scene itself, and, but then they also had the CNN where they were actually playing real clips that aired during the recount. So I would ask people, I don't know whether this would be on a survey or through conversation in regards to actually testing that because that might be more difficult, but that is something I'm interested to learn what they thought of and how they kind of sorted that out because I find it interesting and I find it curious if some people would be able to tell the difference between reenacted because some of it is reenacted and some of it is completely false, some of it is authentic. And so it gives the film a sense of authenticity when you see the CNN logo, but some of that's not real and other, and other times it is real. So that's something I would like to test, but I was that's something I actually didn't do this time around. But I would like to test how long they retain the information. That's probably my biggest. And then also getting people who aren't interested in politics, because it's really <coughs> more indicative of learning more from the film. Especially because people, again, came in with such an interest in politics, you know, 87% already knew what the recount was. You know, people already had a working knowledge base. So that is something I would, I would like to look more into in the future. But you had a question? Me? Yes. I don't know why well, I don't know how I could have any questions because I've been very close to this project for <laughs> over a year, but I do. Uh, and actually, one of them, it's not really a question, it's more of a, kind of an observation uh, in terms of how the discussion has been going already. And it occurred to me that um, in terms of the knowledge that you might anticipate, that, that you, have, you tapped into different types of knowledge. And I think I agree that knowledge of the people will probably diminish over time. But I think knowledge of these concepts, like the chads and the dimples and, and some of the other things you tested, might be something that would be retained more over the long term. So that might yeah. just be a hypothesis. Well, it's that, also like an emotional roller coaster film of sorts. And so people, I think, were impacted by the dramatized elements. And so that end shot, people ended up having this sigh at the end, like, oh man, is this really what happened? I mean, granted, those ballads were destroyed and that shot is completely fictitious. But the fact people have, you know, multiple people call themselves depressed after watching the film. So there is this emotional element, but it's hard for me to figure out a way to test that or their perception of things. That is something I'd love to look into. But at the time, for the time being, based on my limitations, I wasn't able to. But that is something I would love to do in the future. I don't oh, know. No, I was saying, actually, that makes me think of, I, don't, I didn't think of this before, because I wasn't thinking in terms of if you were to do this over the long term. But there is a concept from the sort of persuasion literature, you know, that, um, of course there's a sleeper effect and then disassociation, you know, that says that over time, as time goes on, what, after people are exposed to a message, that the source of the content gets disassociated from the actual content or the message itself. So that's not quite what you're talking about, but No, I, I remember that. I took, I took a persuasion <laughs> class in undergrad. I actually know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. No, I mean, again, the film acts as, a, as kind of a great time capsule of sorts. And so I think it would be interesting to see how that affects people just on an emotional level. I mean, again, I had very specific knowledge questions. It was I was trying to figure a way to determine how they were perceiving things, which I ended up utilizing the focus group discussions for. But that, again, I ended up transcribing all of their quotes. And again, what ends up happening, at least for doing a formal analysis, is people 
people say like, and they kind of pause, or they change their thought midway through. So that is something that I was trying to test for, but I don't know how successful it was. I have a question that's kind of trying to tie in your CCT experience with this thesis. So last spring, you basically wrote your own screenplay. <laughs> And it was about uh, the um, Nixon's checker speech. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about lessons that you learned about the creation of kind of a, you know a, a, a film, an entertainment type film from an actual historical or political event, and how that might have uh, influenced your thought process in terms of preparing the thesis. And I was trying to. It's not. It's not moving, but I do have a slide. I want adaptations. Me. I love. I love. Uh -huh. Oh, you can just say it off. Of yeah, your I mean, head. it's in your little presentation banner. Um, <laughs> so the, on the slide, um, I address Linda Seeger and her beliefs that there are seven key pieces to craft a successful real-life story adaptation. So the central incident, and so when I did the screenplay, I was talking about the Nixon Checkers. The central incident, of course, is the recount process. Uh, a clear climactic event for them, it was the Supreme Court deciding we're going, we're not ruling in your favor. For Nixon, it was giving the Checkers speech and the incident's different after. Um, the main characters can sympathize with the character. That was something I struggled with because Nixon's not that sympathetic. Real. So that was something I'm not quite, again, I didn't actually, I haven't had this looked at by a professional screenwriter yet. That is something that I do believe would be cited for me. <laughs> but the story occurs within a set time period. So the recount, 36 day process, very easy. You know, Danny Starner, the writer, he had set parameters in place. For the Shuckers, that was a little harder for me because I was trying to determine how far in advance and you know, how far after the fact. So for, I ended up deciding, to find my own kind of timeline of when Nixon was offered a role and being a delegate for the Republican Party at that time, and then after the speech itself. So I had to find my own, whereas for Danny Strong, it was very clear. Um, and then drama between two characters. And so for this, it's definitely James Baker versus, as a Republican side, versus Democrats. And for me, it was, again, Nixon kind of versus the American public in a way. It was, he's not a good guy. I mean, we really did research on him. And then visual elements and momentum, so adding drama and suspense. And that's something really difficult to do when people know the events around whatever you're talking about. And so for Nixon, because it was like, I think about 60 something years ago, it was probably a little easier because people probably don't remember that necessarily. But the election for 2000 election, people probably have some sort of knowledge base. So I think Dan Strong had to kind of make those, you know, those decisions along the way. But I think this project itself is really interesting because there's so, you have to, I'm looking at the side because there's Sid Field and Jack Subway things need. And so for adaptations, you need drama and suspense, but what's really problematic when they say based on true events or inspired by true events, and they're not. Where you just have somebody who was a real life person, but this isn't how their life played out. And so that's something I've been kind of following. I mean, when, what's the name of it? The Annotation Game with Alan Turing. When that one best adapted screenplay, I was livid because it's an original screenplay. It's not an adapted screenplay at this point. It's just not. And so, just because you say based on true events and inspired by true events isn't really the case. And those are really loosely used now. And that phrase actually originated in the 90s, I believe, when I started doing research on this area. So it's not something that's been too well known within all of film studies. It's more of a recent phenomenon. And it's almost as if people are using it to preface, this is based on, but it's kind of not. And so now we're in this weird gray area where people say based on true events, but it's really not. And so it's used too easily. And there's not strict criteria quite yet with the writer's skills on how based on and how not based on and what it should be. And so I believe that's something they should fix because I think they were really too loose with that, especially after the invitation game one. I was really upset because when you look at the book, it's like this. They showed this and it changed everything else in between. And so same thing with Braveheart. They say that's based on William Wallace's life. That is not his life. They, no, that's not true. So you have these films that come across in certain ways, and that's really aggravating to me, and so that was something I wanted to study. I mean, recount is based on true events, but it takes a side, and it only shows the Democrat side. The Republicans had issues with absentee ballots in some of our county, but that's not shown in the film. So it does, it only shows some of the, some of the things, not everything. So that's something I'm really curious about, I'm fascinated by, because every film demands change, so. I'm on the science. I'm thinking now of Quentin Tarantino's film where he re rewrote the end of World War II. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> which, um, it was so, you know, in, in a way it was so bizarre and stylistic and typical Tarantino 
fashion that... Only he can get away with that. <laughs> right, exactly. And I thought, oh, this is very interesting just yeah. as a film. But I remember the person with whom I saw it really took issue with it and was very worried that this is the kind of thing, you know, younger generations is their first exposure mm -hmm. to any story about World War II. They take it as it is, or even if they hear it's not completely true, they just kind of like, you know, consume the film and that's it. They're, they're done with it and they, they you know, they're, they get it in this entertainment fashion and it does not inspire further learning. So I'm, I'm, I guess I'm also turn. wondering, with your further yes. research, you're going on to a PhD program. Uh -huh. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm interested in if one of your um, interests yes. in, in further research is um, whether this kind of learning um, culminates in someone just kind of consuming a film and being done with it. That's one of my concerns. Or if yeah. it does inspire further learning, especially That's, when yeah. you're dealing with historical events. And, that's one of my biggest concerns. That's something I've actually spoken to quite a few people about because that is that is one of my fears because when people watch a film and it says based on true events, they think, oh, I'm seeing what actually happened. That's not true at all. And so that's one of my biggest concerns because most people, you know, taking people out of this room, you know, out of the equation, most people are not going to go to additional research. You know, two days elections over, if you watch this film, you think, oh, I have generalized knowledge, that's it, that's all I need. So you're not going to know the Republicans almost lost I think 20,000 ballot, like absentee ballots because people didn't have voting ID numbers on it. So it depends on what research you're going to do after that, and most people aren't. And that was something I was trying to find in prior literature that's more difficult to actually <laughs> kind of find. But people believe there was a conspiracy with JFK based on a film because they didn't go out and do more research or go out to the lectures talking about why JFK wasn't real and why you know the things show were false. And so people do take these. And that's the problem with films because they're visual and people are visual learners and it sticks with them. It's not, you know, it's not just something that's passing. If you watch something that looks true and it, comes, it feels true because it's so dramatic, it stays with them. There's this weird persuasion rhetoric involved and it is so impactful. That's why I think film studies is something people should be paying more attention to. I mean, people use it in the classroom, but I think, you know, if you go to the theater, you are being exposed to it and you are going to be learning or remembering stuff in the future. So that is one of my biggest concerns. That's why I think there should be more guidelines for saying based on true events or not. Because when you say that, it gives the film an authenticity that it probably shouldn't have at this point. I mean, that John Adams miniseries was not authentic, but it said based on events. Not true. You know so many of these <laughs> <laughs> So would you, for your screenplay that you wrote yes. uh, uh, last, would you give it the tag? Do you think it's earned the tag based on No, I don't, events? because I couldn't. So I actually went to a writing workshop, and I actually got laughed at. I was really mad about this, because somebody said, it's really hard to authenticate you know, facts historically. And so I said, well, even from the 1950s, I couldn't find it. They're like, oh, ha, ha, we remember back then. You know, They just kind of brush it off like it wasn't true. But when you try and find quotes, and you try and find real incidents, you just have a very general overview. It's, you end up taking your creative liberties. So I understand why writers have the challenges they, that they do. So I would just say inspired by. I wouldn't say based on for mine. Although because I remember you did tremendous research and oh, yes. worked with the archivist and dug up some good yes. dirt on Pat Nixon. And I have two shelves in my apartment. I live in a studio, and so you know my bookshelves. And you see like entire bookshelves dedicated to Nixon. There's kind of you know syndication. But there's something going on there. I mean, yeah. But yeah, no. I ended up reading I think something like 50 different books for Nixon, and I ended up finding like rare books that were actually out of print. And the people at the library were wonderful, and they helped me get a lot of other stuff going. So that was a lot of research in itself, but even then, when I found all those things, they don't have direct quotes. And this is why you know you have a biography, and then you have the you know autobiography. Well, the autobiography, someone's gonna make themselves sound better than it really was. With the biography, people are looking in as an outsider, and you're still not gonna get all the information. So no matter what I was looking at, things were wrong. So it's so hard to craft a narrative, let alone an accurate narrative. So I would just say inspired by for mine, just not based on. It's not. But again, I'm aware of the differences. Somebody else probably like, oh, this is based on because you have the timeline, generally speaking. Actually, yeah. in the thesis itself, um, I thought one of the most compelling uh, chapters was where you did the fact versus fiction Thank you. and uh, really did an extremely close read of that and really backing it up against the, the um, facts. And I was kind of thinking about you know, the point that you make about using it as uh, an educational tool and putting it in the classroom. And uh, having spent a lot of time recently with civic educators, including this past weekend in LA, where we just got back at 2 a.m. this morning. Um, wow! But uh, yes, I'm dedicated. <laughs> <laughs> but um, basically, 
I was kind of thinking, you know, just hearing some of their pedagogy or whatever, one way that you would have to use a film like this if you were to use it responsibly would be to have the class do that. Okay, you've watched the film and maybe have the students investigate, is this how it really happened? And have them kind of reflect on and research the, the true events. And in that way it could be used as a teaching tool, but I fear that the way that it would often be used is, okay, I don't feel like you know, doing my lecture this yeah. day, I'm going to put in recounts and that's how they're going to learn about it. And it does have the democratic take on yeah, it. Really and, you know, and, and young students who, you, you know, if the ones I'm dealing with are, you know, from junior high, high school teachers, if they're, you know, this is going to be an impression that will probably, you know, kind of last yeah. with them. And, um, oh, no, I mean, when I did additional research, again, I was really young during this, I didn't really remember the specifics. And so I learned a lot more when I started, you know, diving into the 2000 related literature. I mean, I learned a lot more about the Republican side. You know, they had a Thanksgiving dinner to thank their volunteers, which was really nice of them. And people would retell their stories of, you know, being in the streets and trying to help get ballots counted and, oh, how they determined this one was ballot and this one, you know, was a dimple and things of that nature. I mean, I learned a lot about that process from doing external research, but they don't actually address all the Republicans' issues. There were a lot of smart court cases that weren't addressed. I remember talking to you about this because I was so baffled by this. Um, the Republicans, um, when they were going up to the Florida Supreme Court, there was a draft opinion floating around. Prior to giving their argument at all, there was a draft opinion stating why they agreed with the Gore team and what the recount should you know, end up being. This is before they presented. And so they were looking like, do we, we talk to our lawyer about this? Do we tell them what's going on? No, maybe. And so they <coughs> had this debate prior to going to court, knowing they're going in to lose. But that's not shown in the film because it makes them more sympathetic and they don't appear to be antagonistic <laughs> because they're not fighting the moral high ground anymore. They have their own problems. And I actually didn't know this until I was talking and doing research and stuff, but partial recounts are not allowed. And so that was something that was a big problem because Palm Beach County had a partial recount. Well, that, those numbers reverted back to the original state because those aren't allowed. But they were trying to get that passed as, okay, we only got this much done, but you can't do that. That's not how recount laws work. But the film doesn't say why you can't allow partial recounts or what the problems with that is. And so that's something people would have to learn by doing external research. But again, you don't know that just watching the film. So I think people would need to do more research and learn from textbooks and everything else. But. Well, does anyone have any other questions? Well, thank you very much, Angela. It was <laughs>